Now, as we've been saying for some time, this afternoon we're going to begin our weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. And we also said some time back that teaching would precede that practice. And so this, this sermon is intended to kind of do two things. Uh, perhaps it will persuade you uh, to be more favorable towards this practice. No, no one has expressed uh, a, a reticence or a resistance, and so that's not what I mean, but just perhaps persuade you more. Uh, and then secondly, I want to confirm us in those who are, are ready for this, but perhaps need better grounding. And I prepared a, a handout for you. It's in the back if you didn't receive it. It'll be helpful to follow along because there's many points, uh, but we won't spend much time on, on each one. You don't have to have it, but if you'd like to, there's a handout in the back that goes along with uh, the sermon. And so in as brief a time as possible, first I want to consider theological reasons what does the Bible tell us about the Lord's Supper, and how does that inform our desire to practice it weekly, theological arguments or reasons? Uh, and then I want to respond to a few common objections. There are valid questions to ask or objections to raise to a, week, a weekly practice of the Lord's Supper. And then lastly, conclude with some practical benefits. If we celebrate this weekly, these are the effects. In practice, this is what it can do to help and benefit our church. So let's start with those seven theological arguments. And this is one of those kinds of sermons that collects the teaching of the scripture and presents it on a particular topic, more than just looking at one passage in particular and focusing on that. We're focusing on a biblical doctrine more than a biblical text in this kind of sermon. The first of these seven theological arguments that I would present to you is it's important to understand that the Lord's Supper is a meal with Jesus. It's not just the supper of the Lord. We could say it's a supper with the Lord. The Lord's Supper is a meal with Jesus. Think about the language that Jesus used when he instituted the Lord's Supper. You didn't invent the Lord's Supper. I didn't invent the Lord's Supper. We do this because Jesus instituted it. He knows what he's doing. And so we need to pay attention to the language and the words that Jesus used when he instituted the Lord's Supper. He spoke about how this is my body. And this is my blood, referring to what the bread and the wine symbolize. They symbolize his body and his blood. And so we, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are supping, we are having a dinner with our Lord Jesus Christ. Just as the, the disciples sat at the table with Jesus, so also we in the Lord's Supper sit with Jesus. And you might say, that doesn't make sense. Because they sat with Jesus, and we are not sitting with Jesus in the same way. But you know, this is why Pastor College's sermon this morning and last week are the perfect preparation. The disciples said, but Jesus, you won't be here. And what did Jesus say to them? No, no, no. I will be here with you. I am with you because I'm giving you my spirit as the guarantee of my presence. So the spirit guarantees that Jesus is present with us. Not just in general, how, how does the Spirit work? The Spirit works through appointed means. The Spirit is present, working, accomplishing Jesus' purposes through the means that he has ordained. The Lord's Supper is one of those things, one of those means of grace, one of those things through which Jesus applies his redemptive work to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we come to the bread and the wine, we recognize that he is spiritually present to us. The Holy Spirit works through these physical, tangible things to minister to us. And so we are not just supping, we're not just eating to eat or drinking to drink. This is a special meal, and it's a meal with Jesus. Paul uses language in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 of communion or participation with Jesus in the supper. He says, and this is in your outline, he says in 1 Corinthians 10 verses 16 and 17, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ or older translations, a communion? The bread that we break, is it not a participation or communion in the body of Christ? Christ. 
The answer he's looking for is yes, yes it is. It is participation in Christ and his body. It is a participation in Christ and his, bro- and his blood. He goes on to say, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. That word participation is italicized to emphasize the fact that we commune with our Lord and Savior in the supper. It is a meal with Jesus. If that's the case, how often do you want to sup with Jesus? How often do you want to gather together and dine with your Lord and say, He is with us. He has left us these tokens to remind us He is with us. We are just as much supping with Him as the disciples did. We may not be able to lean on Him, which I'm sure we would love to do, but we can see Him by faith presented to our eyes in the supper. The supper is a meal with Jesus. Secondly, and bear with me if this moves quickly because I just want to get through the points and present this uh, to you for your sake uh, and for future sake. Secondly, the Lord's Supper is a meal for our souls. The Lord's Supper is a meal for our souls. We eat bread, we drink the wine, and our bodies are slightly nourished. (laughs) I always say to the elders, can we have more of each one? But that's just me. The Lord's Supper is a meal for our souls. How so? How so? Well, let's read a paragraph from our Confession of Faith which describes what this means. Our Confession of Faith in chapter 30, paragraph 7 says, Worthy receivers, meaning those who come in faith, outwardly partaking of the visible elements in this ordinance, in other words, those who eat and drink, do then also inwardly, by faith, really and indeed, yet not carnally and corporally, but spiritually receive and feed upon Christ crucified and all the benefits of his death, the body and blood of Christ being then not corporally or carnally, but spiritually present to the faith of believers in that ordinance as the elements themselves are to their outward senses. What this is saying is just as really and truly as my body is fed by the bread and the wine, so also just as really and truly my soul, my spirit, is fed by Jesus Christ, symbolized by the bread and the wine. We talked about last week in 1 Peter that in regeneration, the soul consists of uh, the mind, the will, and the affections, and how God changes our minds, and he changes our wills, and he changes our affections. To be spiritually nourished means that God, not encounters, but God confronts our minds. He interacts with our minds. He interacts with our will. He interacts with our affections through the Lord's Supper. It's a meal for my soul, for my mind to learn things, for my mind to be reminded of things, for my will to be more and more conformed to God's will, and for my affections, my love, and my joy, and my hope, and my confidence, for all of these things to be moved and propelled by something else. Well, what is that something else that changes my mind or reminds me of things I have forgotten or that conforms my will more and more to God and moves my soul towards joy and towards hope and towards confidence and towards contentment? Well, what does that is the supper as it points me to Jesus Christ. The supper is a meal for our souls. And for those who come to this supper with faith, Trusting in what the supper promises and portrays, they are as really spiritually fed as their bodies are physically fed. If it's true that the supper feeds our souls, how often do you want your soul to be fed? I say every single Sunday. Do not the other means of grace feed our souls? They do. No question. But the supper also feeds souls. Our souls, as it presents Jesus Christ to us spiritually, and by faith we receive him, his death, and all of its benefits. There's another quote here from 
Uh, the catechism that we often use here at our church, it's a long quote, so I won't read it, but I encourage you to read it on your own time. And if you're a member of the church and you don't have a copy of, of an Orthodox catechism, please let me know and I will get you a copy. Thirdly, the supper is a meal with Jesus. It's a meal for our souls. It's also a meal with one another. It's a communal meal. It's a family meal. We've already read Paul saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we who are many are one body. Why? Because we all partake of the one bread. Paul says elsewhere in this same letter that if you have a few people who come together early and they eat and then there's nothing left for other people, if you have a, a fragmented supper, he said that's actually not the Lord's Supper which you're eating. The Lord's Supper is a communal meal. We eat not just with Jesus individually and secretly. It's not just me and Jesus privately. The supper is something that we all do together. We who partake of the one bread are many. And because we partake of the one bread, we are one body. Paul uses the language of when you come together as a church, that's when you partake of the Lord's Supper. And so therefore, how often do we come together as a church? And how often do we want to eat together of that one body and blood that makes us one body? How often do we want to partake of the one bread? I say as often as we come together as a church. Families that eat together often find great benefit and blessing in that, just in our own homes. If you are able to eat together as a family, it's a wonderful blessing. I think that our modern culture and context often makes that difficult, especially living here in so much traffic. It's hard. It's difficult for people to be together and eat together in the home. We're all so busy. Everyone has a job. Everyone has a car. Everyone is everywhere. But when you can all be together, when you can sit down and eat together, it, it strengthens your bonds, doesn't it? Bonds of family, bonds of blood. Well, in the supper, we all eat together when we come together as a church. And I believe it is best for us, whenever we come together as a church, we being many to partake of the one bread and therefore show that we are one body. Fourthly, the Lord's Supper proclaims God's covenant with us. The Lord's Supper proclaims God's covenant with us. You've heard from me many times over the years that the supper speaks, that the bread and the wine have a message, that they talk, that they communicate to us. And when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he, he showed the cup to the disciples and he said, this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? It means that the cup reminds us, republishes, it declares the covenant of God. It proclaims the covenant of God with us. If we are in covenant with God, do you want to know the details? If someone said, I'm selling you a house, or I'm selling you a car, or I'd like to enter into a business relationship with you, the details of those contracts or negotiations are all important, aren't they? Is this a good business deal? Is this a wise purchase of the house? Is this a good contract? The terms and conditions that apply are often extremely important for whether or not you get involved in something like that. Well, when we hear that the God of the universe is in covenant with us, don't you want to know the terms and conditions? Don't you want to know what is involved in God's covenant with us? Certainly, you ought to. And the Lord's Supper proclaims that. Well, this brings us to number five, because the next question becomes, well, then what does the covenant entail? What does the covenant promise to us? If we just stop and say that the supper proclaims the covenant, but we don't say what the covenant includes or involves, then we won't know what we're doing. But when Jesus says, this is the new covenant in my blood, what does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? Fifthly, 
the Lord's Supper assures us, promises us, that our sins are forgiven by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The bread and the wine proclaim the covenant, and the promise of the covenant is, you can read it there in Hebrews 10 with me, in the context of of the writer's uh, discourse. He says, For by a single offering, Jesus has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. One offering. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. The Holy Spirit testifies. The Holy Spirit advances an argument that Jesus' single offering perfects his people for all time. How does the Holy Spirit witness to us about this? For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, this is the proof, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. What's the conclusion? Where there is forgiveness of these, where there is forgiveness of sins and lawless deeds, there is no longer any offering for sin. If Jesus has offered one single perfect sacrifice that once and for all takes away our sins, and if God's covenant promises and guarantees that to us, and if the supper is designed to remind us of this and proclaim it and republish it to us, then every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, God is saying from heaven to man through the bread and through the wine, your sins are forgiven in the name and in the blood of my son, Jesus Christ. Now I ask you, how often do you want to hear heaven say that to you? In Protestant and Reformed liturgies, meaning order of worship, one of the common features is a corporate confession of sin, and then a resultant or consequent declaration of pardon. And that's something that we often incorporate into our liturgy in the pastoral prayer, confessing our sins to God and being reassured of his forgiveness to us. A weekly participation in the Lord's Supper does this even louder, even more clearly, God speaks to his people and says, Those who come to my son in faith, those who rest in and receive my son's single and perfect sacrifice, their sins are forgiven once and for all. The Lord's Supper assures us that our sins are forgiven by the single and perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. One of the wonderful things about the Supper and I've said this before various times, is that it assaults our senses. It doesn't insult our senses. It assaults our senses. We are sheep. We are foolish and wayward. And God comes to us with the supper, and he says, Stop. Come together. Take this in your hands. Look at it. Bless it. Now put it in your mouth and eat it and drink it and know and remember your sins are forgiven. He doesn't just speak to our ears through the sup- through if when the supper is incorporated into the, the worship of the church, God does not just speak to us through our ears. In the supper, he speaks to us through our eyes and through our hands and through our noses and through our mouth- mouths so that we taste his promises and we smell his promises and we see his promises and we feel his promises and we hear his promises. He assaults every sense of the human body to say, your sins are forgiven. It reminds me of Jesus when he dealt with people that were deaf or blind and he would he would touch them in the place where he was going to heal them because they they didn't know what was going to happen either because they were blind or deaf and he would he would help them they had the sense of touch he's going to heal my ears or he's going to heal my eyes here in the supper everyone can receive and be blessed through the supper building off of this number six There's a chain of connections here. If the supper republishes the covenant and reassures us that our sins are forgiven, therefore also, number six, the Lord's Supper assures us that God loves us. 
the Lord's Supper assures us that God loves us. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 10. God said, For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. His steadfast love shall not depart, and his covenant of peace shall not be removed. Notice the parallel that we have here. His steadfast love is his covenant of peace, and neither of them can be removed because they are one and the same. It is possible to tear down a mountain. It is possible to erode a hill, but you cannot remove, you cannot take away or cause to depart the steadfast love of the Lord given to us in the everlasting covenant of peace. And the supper, what does it do but remind us of that? My everlasting covenant of peace is with you. My steadfast love is upon you, and it cannot be removed. Similarly, Isaiah 55 and verse 3. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Who is David's greater son? It's Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, God's everlasting covenant and steadfast, sure love is given unto us. The supper reminds us God loves us. Do you ever say to your spouse or to your child or to a friend, you tell me you love me too much. It's too much. Don't tell me every day. That's that's too much. Too much love. No, you'd say, we all have a desire to be loved, and we want to hear that. We want to know that on a regular basis, even from our our spouses or friends or, or children or parents. We want that from other people. Well, in the supper, God comes to us and says, I love you. My covenant of peace reassures you. I love you. My steadfast love has been placed upon you, and it cannot be removed, nor shall it be removed. God can no more cease loving us than he can cease loving his son, because we are in his son. As Paul says at the end of Romans chapter 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Seventhly, as we conclude these theological arguments for weekly communion, we want to hear God tell us he loves us on a regular basis. Number seven, the Lord's Supper assures us that Christ will return and we will be resurrected. I could put a footnote here that just says, see this morning's sermon. Pastor Campbell spoke specifically about this. But just remember that in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We've said many times that every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are hoping and even praying that it's the last time we ever partake of the Lord's Supper. Why? Because we don't want the tokens of our Lord, we want our Lord. Which is not to diminish our appreciation for Christ's true presence with us in the supper. It's just to say that we want his mode of presence to not be spiritual, but also physical with us. We want our Lord to return in the flesh. And we want him to raise up our bodies in new, in, in new glory and life. We want the fullness of our salvation. It's the same thing as a... a A bride waiting for the bridegroom. She doesn't want to be... a. She wants to be the bride on the wedding day. She wants that day to arrive. She's waiting for the bridegroom to to come to the wedding. To come through the gates and say, I'm here to take you to my home. That's how we feel at this rehearsal dinner. We say, can we we get past the rehearsal dinner and, and move on to the wedding feast? That's what we mean when we say we want this to be our last. Because... Jesus said, I will not drink again of this cup until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. And we say, we want that day above all. God give us patience until then. But the Lord's Supper assures us until that time, he is with us. He is caring for us. He loves us. Our sins are forgiven. 
And Paul says in Romans 6, 5, that if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. The supper is so visibly portraying his death, and we are united to him in his death by faith. And so we have a, an assurance and a reassurance in the supper that we will be resurrected in glory as he was. How often do you want to be reminded that your bridegroom is coming back for you to take you to his home, to take you to his kingdom, and that he will raise you up in glory and light and life forever? I want to be reminded of that every single week. Well, let's briefly consider four common Objections or responses, followed by four practical arguments. Number one, there may be some people who would say this practice, meaning weekly Lord's Supper, cannot be proven from Scripture. And I would say, we are agreed. Let's move on. It cannot be proven that we must do this, nor are we saying we must do this. Because if we were saying we must do this, then we would be saying we have been in sin up until this point. We are not saying that we must partake of the Lord's Supper every Sunday. But as true as it is that you cannot force anyone to take the Supper weekly from the Scripture, neither could you deny the freedom to partake of the Supper on a weekly basis. It cannot be proven that we must do this, but it is undeniable that we may do it. So please understand, if, if for some reason you feel that your conscience is being obligated or forced, it is not. We are not saying that weekly communion is the one and only way which Jesus has instituted for his church. Secondly, preaching is the primary means of grace, and the supper will supersede it. Supersede it. The Lord's Supper speaks for itself, as we've said, which means that it occupies its own place in the church's liturgy. It has its own part to play. It has its own function to fulfill. It has its own role. And so this helps us to recognize that communion meditations are not necessary every time you partake of the Lord's Supper. People who partake are not thinking, what are we doing? Why? What does this mean? Because the supper speaks for itself. And when the minister says, Jesus has spoken, this is my body, this is my blood, for you, for your salvation, for the forgiveness of your sins, that is a sufficient message in and of itself to say that's why we're doing this and that's what it signifies, that's what it means. So that means that the preaching can remain the preaching and be the preaching from the texts that the preachers have chosen as we ordinarily move consecutively through the word of God. The supper does not need to change that or alter it or take away from that in any way. Each one holds its own place and fulfills its own function. We preach from the word of God. We partake of the Lord's Supper, which is the word of God in a visible and tangible form. So the preaching does not need to change at all in order to introduce weekly Lord's Supper. Thirdly, some people may think or object or wonder what was special will become stale. What was special will become stale. Repetition is good. And we repeat every single week hymns and reading and prayer and preaching. We have the same order of service every single week and we do the same things every single week. Do we ever say, you know what, let's take prayer out for a couple weeks because I think we're just not praying with focus and with fervor. So we're going to take prayer out of the rotation until our hearts are ready for it again. Or would we say, you know what, people haven't really been giving good attention to the preaching, so we're going to take it out, let it sit, refresh it, come back to it in a few weeks. We'd say, no, God's given these things to us as a way for us to render worship unto him, but also ways in which he speaks to us. And the supper is just one of those various means of grace. We do everything else on a regular and weekly basis. Are you tired of singing God's praises? Is he no longer worthy? Are you tired of hearing his word preached? Is it just boring? And isn't it true that sometimes you do sing and then you think, 
what did I sing? What verse are we on? Or, you, or someone says amen at the end of the prayer, and you think, oh, uh, I wasn't there. <laughs> amen at the end of it. So we know it's true. It happens that in our regular participation in the means of grace, it happens to us that we may go through the motions without focus, without faith even, because we're not focused. It does happen. That's true. But the abuse of, the, of a thing does not negate the use of a thing. Remember that. The abuse of a thing does not negate the use of a thing. So even if, if there was a person for whom the Lord's Supper became just, okay, it's a thing we do, so I'm doing it, that would not negate the real use. It would just mean they have a problem. It would mean that person needs to come with a heart more prepared and a mind more informed and faith more hungry to eat at the table of the Lord with the Lord. The problem is not in the supper. The problem is not in the weekly observance of the supper. The problem is in the person and their heart and their condition entering the house of God. And this sermon is intended to help us not be in that condition, not come to the house of God in that way, and not to approach the table flippantly or lightly or in an uninformed manner. Fourthly and lastly, some will say, we have never done this before. That's true. That's true. Next, <laughs> I think it's interesting to me that we are the last church in our local association to begin this. All the other churches practice weekly communion. Does that mean that we have to or that we should? No. I'm just telling you, sister churches with the same beliefs as us, we're the last one to take up this practice, whereas they all have been doing so some sooner but some longer uh, in this way. And if you look at the history of the church, there is a massive weight of evidence that weekly uh, communion, weekly Lord's Supper, was the, the practice of the ancient medieval and Reformation churches, though certainly you can find exceptions to that in other parts of church history. So we may have never done it before, but it's certainly a common and well-established practice in the church. This brings us to our final section of four practical arguments. Kind of a so what. The first section was kind of so why. This is kind of so what. Number one, weekly communion makes the church more visible. Weekly communion makes the church more visible. One of the things that I have really enjoyed about the changes that we have made is having everyone come up to the front to partake of the Lord's Supper. I really enjoy that and appreciate that because it says we who come to the table, we who dine together, we are the sheep of Jesus Christ. We are the church. And there are some who don't come up to the front. What does that say? There's an evangelistic benefit. As the church is made more visible, I am not going forward. You can ask that person, why not? They would have to say, because I don't believe in the Christ whose body and blood are symbolized here. I, don't re I won't repent of my sin, and I don't trust in that Christ. And we'd say, that's right, and that's why you don't come to this table, nor should you. But we invite you to repent of your sins, and to believe in this Christ, and to join us, who are many, in this one bread and this one body. Weekly communion makes the church more visible. We who come together at the table, we are the church of Jesus Christ. And we want as many people as possible who are here to be part of that, to come to Jesus Christ. Remember that Christianity is not a, a personal, private thing. Well, I have my faith, and you have your faith, and we all go our separate way, and we all read our Bible and see what God says to us. No. Jesus has established the church. He has ordered the church. He has given it officers and members, and he has given it certain means of grace and elements of worship, and we are to engage with the church and join the church as he has instituted it. And so the supper is just one more part of that, that more visibly shows. Everyone stands, almost everyone sings. When we pass the plate, it just goes through the pews. But when we rise up and say, I come to this table because I believe in Jesus Christ, it's just as visible as who gets baptized and who doesn't. It makes the church 
eminently visible to our own eyes and to the eyes of unbelievers, and it becomes even an evangelistic benefit for them. Secondly, weekly communion makes peace more essential. We all have an obligation to live at peace with one another. It is a command to be at peace among ourselves. But communion makes it more urgent, more essential. You're going to come to this table with your brothers and sisters, so work it out. (laughs) Get along. When you have the Lord's Supper once a month, and we say something like, if you have a conflict with brethren or any reason that would disrupt the unity of the church, you need to work through those things. If that's once a month, if it's not that Sunday, what can people do? They can just, whatever, you know. We'll just let things go. But when it's the weekly Lord's Supper, it's saying, listen, the whole family's eating tonight. We're having family dinner. So deal with it. Work it out. Come to an agreement. Be at peace. Repent to one another. Forgive one another so that we can join in this table without distraction or disunity. Weekly communion makes that peace more essential, more urgent. Come united, not divided. If we come divided, it no longer is the Lord's Supper. That's one of Paul's points in 1 Corinthians. Thirdly, Weekly communion makes discipline more palpable. You feel it more. What what do I mean? How does church discipline work? Well, it begins with personal confrontation, perhaps by just brother to brother or sister to sister kind of thing. But it advances when? When the person will not repent of their sin, it must advance. Okay, take someone else with you. Confront them about the thing. They still will not repent. Take it to the elders. The elders will deal with them personally. They still will not repent. Take it to the church. The church is then informed by a public rebuke. So-and-so has persisted in such and such a sin unrepentantly. If at any point in the process, repentance comes into play, it stops. There's no need for further discipline. But when unrepentance is, is the problem, then, adv- then discipline must advance. After a public rebuke, what is next? If they still will not repent of their sin, then we must suspend them from the table. We must deny them the right to come to the Lord's Supper. Because the body and blood of our Lord and the forgiveness of sins promised in his covenant is not for the one who refuses to repent. It is not for the one who will not turn from their sin. The covenant does not not just promise forgiveness of sins. It also promises, I will cause you to walk in my ways. I will give you a new heart. I will write my law upon you. So the one who refuses to conform to God's law, who refuses to repent according to God's law, who refuses to be restored, the other promise of the covenant is not for them until they show fruit that is more in keeping with repentance. Now, if the Lord's Supper, if that's the most severe discipline before excommunication, and it is the the most severe before excommunication, if the supper is only once a month, honestly, This is an opinion. I don't think it means much to those people. I've seen it happen at our church many times. Okay, you can, you know, you take away the supper. They don't care. They don't feel it. But if every single Sunday, the body of Christ is coming together and say, this body, this blood is for us, you are not to come forward. Every single Sunday. Then they are very visibly being shown you are under discipline. And these tokens, these promises from God are not for you. That should be a much more palpable discipline, something that they feel a lot more because it's very obvious. You are not to come forward while at the same time it is a call. What must I do to come forward? Be a perfect Christian? No, be a repentant Christian. We're not superstars that come down the aisle. It's not a parade of, we did it, we did it. It's those who come in repentance and faith. And so the person under discipline will not repent, and they are not to partake. They will feel that more with weekly Lord's Supper. Fourthly and lastly, weekly communion makes Christ more central. Notice I'm not saying it makes Christ central. It makes him more central. Christ should be already central. 
in the way that we read the Bible, in the way that we sing our praises, in the way that we pray, and in the preaching of the word. All these things should be Christ-centered on their own, each one in its own way and in its own place. And so therefore, the Lord's Supper does not make Christ central to the worship of the church. It makes him more central. And I want to explain that, or explain what I mean, a little bit more. And this is something that you've also heard from me over the past few years, perhaps more, perhaps less. It's that in our, in Reformed churches, Reformed Baptist churches, Calvinistic churches, evangelical churches that are more conservative and Calvinistic, in the churches of our orbit, orbit, whether closely or not so closely defined, one of the imbalances that we sometimes find in our churches is an over, well, you can't over idolize something, you just idolize it or you don't. It's an overestimation and an, a hyper focus on the man behind the pulpit. Well, I'm at this church because I really like so-and-so's preaching, or I could sit under so-and-so's preaching the rest of my life. A lot of people make choices about where they go to church based on how much they like the preaching. And, and people in churches become attached to the minister, or perhaps to ministers in their church. They're, they're focused on the man. I just love the way that he teaches, or I just love the way that he preaches. And they're man-focused. This problem is not just in the pews. This problem is also in the pulpits, where people who preach make themselves a center of attention, and they make themselves a center of attraction, perhaps not even intentionally, but it happens. It's something that happens. And the preaching at that point and the preacher become overinflated, hyperinflated in the minds of people and in the balance of weight that they give to the church and what the church should be and what a given church is. Well, let's just say this. It's very difficult to have the pastor so-and-so show and then the Lord's Supper. Because if it's about pastor so-and-so being witty and funny and a strong personality, and then it's the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper tells us it's not about him. It's not about the person behind the pulpit. You are not saved. Your sins are not forgiven because of him, so you shouldn't be here because of him. Why are we all here? We are all here because we believe in the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the supper reminds us of that. The supper says, at the end of the day, literally and figuratively, at the end of the day, why are we here? Because of the body and blood of our Lord. Now, are the, the gifts of preachers important for churches and our gifts variously distributed in the church of Christ. Yes, we don't have to deny those things. But the supper can be a proper balance to where you don't have the pastor so-and-so show and then the Lord's Supper. Rather, you have the minister under the word, giving the word to the people through the written word, and then the minister under the word, giving the word to the people in the visible word. And and the preached word and the sacramental word are just as much the minister giving Christ to the people. And you can swap out the height and the look and the voice of the preacher, and it doesn't matter because the same Christ is being given to the people of Christ. The supper helps us to do this. Our confession of faith... I don't think I have it in your handout. That's okay. If there's a hymnal in front of you, go to the back of the hymnal. And let's see, it's going to be on page... Page 686. Chapter 30 of the Lord's Supper. We already read paragraph 7, but I just want to read paragraph 1 to conclude the sermon. Page 
This is what we confess. We confess this faith. The supper of the Lord Jesus was instituted by him the same night wherein he was betrayed to be observed in his churches unto the end of the world for the perpetual remembrance and showing forth the sacrifice of himself in his death, confirmation of the faith of believers and all the benefits thereof, their spiritual nourishment and growth in him, their further engagement in and to all duties which they owe unto him, and to be a bond and pledge of their communion with him and with each other. You see here that we are reminded of Jesus' death. We are fed and nourished spiritually by Jesus' death. We are moved to a greater obedience unto him. We are reminded of our greater we are reminded in a greater way of our obligations unto him as well as to each other. All of this is a benefit that we can receive from the Lord's Supper every single Sunday with God's blessing.